Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Nothing Personal. Today's guest defies introductions, as some people simply call him a literary genius. The others merely raise their eyebrows at the mere mention of his name. We have with us Carl Muller. Carl, welcome to Nothing Personal. Could Thank I first you. find out first? Most people would think that it is Carl Muller, but you pronounce your name Carl Muller. How did that come about? Well, look at it this way. A Muller can be the root of all evil. Indeed. And a Muller could be one of the one blossoms of jam fruit tree. Who was it that decided that it was Muller and not Muller? Well, I don't know, but they always call me Muller. <laughs> was and it from school days? In school, they said Kehil Muller. Okay. I liked it. And it stuck? Stuck. So the two dots have disappeared from the yo. No, I don't need two dots anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> what was growing up like? There is a lot that has been written. Um, yes. There's a lot that you have talked about. I don't wish to repeat myself. You see, uh, let me say, just put it very succinctly, growing up was uh, one of those unreasonable experiences of childhood. How, how, what I, kind of bearing did it have on you? It didn't have much of a bearing except in my own mind. Which is why I think I started to write. Because as a boy, I would sit in the little bit of storeroom that was given to me to call my own. And I would write. I would write of all the things that I detested and hated and that had also overcome me in my own life. The lack of love, the misunderstandings, the joy of the no joy situation I had as a boy. The thrashings I used to get from my father, the way my mother seemed to detest me for reasons I could not understand. And I used to write it all down. And then I used to go and burn it, what I wrote, fearing that it will be seen or read by somebody in the family. But I'll tell you something. Every paper I burnt, the words I wrote were also burnt in my head. So it was therapeutic. It was therapeutic and it helped me to remember and to write it in as mocking a way as possible in my three burger books. It was a hit back at the people who, who said I was their son, the son they did not want. And I was the eldest. And you had 12? Six brothers and six sisters. And do you know something? They all emigrated to England. And they abandoned me. They left me behind. Because really? I had called my own mother a prostitute, which she was. So telling you that much will tell you exactly what type of a life I had to lead. I had no company in my own home. After I was born, my father had three sisters, three daughters. My next brother was about 12 years younger than me. I had no company. I had to leave home. I used to go out and make, make my own waves, make my own hills, do what I liked, and come back. School? School. I, I detested school. Why? Because it, for me, formal teaching was just a mass of nonsense. Mm -hmm. Open your textbooks, read this, read that, do this, do that. Was Where it, was the creativity in teaching? Was it the education part that you detested or was it the mere formality of it or the, or the draconianness of it or was it the... I detested the, the manner in which education was push down our gullets. It was, it was like when I was in Sharjah, we interviewed a man who came and said, an American man who came to the office and said, I have been intensely educated. 
I asked him straight, because I was one of the vice presidents of the company, I asked him straight to his face, intensely educated, what did they do? Push it down your throat, the way you feed a python? And he looked at me and gaped. What was he trying to do? Show me that he was such an educated person, so intensely educated, that he could take my job any day. I am not intensely educated. I had to educate myself. I used to rob my father's money and buy books, second-hand books to read, until he found me out. And then when my father ever found me out doing something that he did not like, he first had to catch me. You did have fast feet. Yes. I had all the escape routes laid out. <laughs> but when he did catch me, normally when I'm asleep, he used to tie me to a jack tree in the front garden and whip me. So, yet in my books, I did have a tremendous admiration for the old man. He was something that I could not be. He was tall, strong, abominably strong. And he used to fight. He used to fight like a demon. In fact, the railway is full of stories of the things he did. And the Yaka de Yaka is a... Yes. I, I featured him prominently in Yaka de Yaka. See? So, I still had a sneaking regard for him because he did things which I would not have dared to do. But then I was too young then. So from school you go on to the army, to the no, Navy first? The Navy. To the Navy first. Yes. Why the Navy? No, it's simple. He just kicked me out of home. I, in fact, he beat me out of home. And I had to get into hospital. Because when he beat me, he beat me with a firewood stick. And one of those rubber firewood sticks can really hurt. Uh, so I went home, went out of home. I went across the canal banks onto the other side. And I lived with some friends there. And I never came home. When the advertisement appeared that the Navy was seeking for recruits, I applied to the Gamano Gorbuk camp and they took me in. Okay, so, I did four years in the Navy. I came home once or twice. That's all. Why did you leave? I left the Navy because my father retired and then he was struggling to survive. He needed money. At the same time, I had also met a girl who was going to be my first wife in the Hindala convent. You see, that's another strange thing because I'm a pianist. You play jazz piano. I play jazz piano. I play anything on the piano. And I was in the Navy jazz band. I played a town hall for 31st night dances. I have thrown some people out over the balcony there. I used to leave the piano, the stage, the, the platform and go down and I found a girl screaming and because some fellow was holding her too tight with a glass of arak in his hand and trying to squeeze all, all sorts of things which she is supposed to have had. And I used, to, I used to ball up him on the floor and throw the glass of arak out of the window and oh, all sorts of things, you know. Because I had this ferocious anger in me all the time. It was burning in me all the time. You know, it was so hard to think that I could go up to a man and grin at him and hit him. And I carried the scars of those things on me. When, I, when my first son, I bought him a bicycle when he was about six years. And he was riding it and somebody, some man from the snatched the bike off him and pushed him off and took the bike and went. I followed that man. And I beat him up. And he took a knife and stabbed me. And I have 16 stitches up my stomach here. But Dr. Milroy Paul had to put my, take my guts and sew them together. And they, saw, they said it was a laparotomy. And somebody asked me later, what did they, where did they cut you open? I said, in my lap. But it didn't seem to matter so much. 
When I left the Navy, okay, I... You went to the Army after that? Yeah. What happened is I was recalled in 1958 for an ex-serviceman squad. But when I reported to the Navy, they said, not here, you go to Army headquarters. And they chased me there. I think with a sigh of relief because I played hell in the Navy. Anyway, I went there and I was put into uniform and told to Dakunu Atta, Vammata and all sorts of things and how to talk in Sinhalese and march and I don't know. <laughs> they sent me to Diyatalawa and there I got, uh, I was then taken out to the, for guarding places during the riots and uh, for some reason or another I got a bottle of sand on my head. Someone had thrown a bottle of sand at me. My head and I dropped over my machine gun, took me to the services hospital, and then took me back to Diyatalawa, where that's supposed to be a rest camp. And I started getting blackouts, sudden inability to see, rushed to Badulla Hospital, there was a Dr. Dabrera there. He told me to go back to the service hospital in Colombo. Dr. Kramer of the service hospital in Colombo treated me, took me to the senior neurologist in Colombo, I think it was Dr. Cabral or somebody. That man put me through, I don't know what, it's supposed to be an electroencephalograph, ECG or EEG test. I thought to myself, now, I'm in trouble now. I've got to get out of this damn thing. I've got to leave this army. The only way I can leave the army now, with a certain good remark on my discharge certificate is to, to be, leave it as medically unfit. Now this thing that Dr. Cabral did was very amusing. He put wires all over my head and uh, you know things on the chest and all that and connected me to a machine and then said now put a picture in front of me and said now look at that picture it's a nice happy picture swan swimming on in the water and beautiful trees and all that. Look at that and feel relaxed. I looked at it and decided what I'm going to do with those two swans. <laughs> and also what I could do with my mother-in-law and with various other people who I didn't like. And obviously it took a wrong And reading. this darn thing kept needle kept on jumping so much as to the type of things I was thinking of that Dr. Cabra looked at it and said, unfit to remain in the army, unfit <laughs> to even hold a gun. And you were summarily discharged. Gave me phenobarbital and all sorts of things to take and I was supposed to sleep 12 hours a day and not to, not to have any exertion, keep my mind free, relax. I left the place and joined this Colombo Port Commission where I worked 24 hours a day on duty and 12 hours off. And you were fine. And I was perfect, of course. How did you get into writing as a profession? No, not as a profession. I used to write for the fun of it. I used to write for the school magazines. I, I used to write for, you know, I used to also write love letters for my friends who couldn't write to their girls. They said, I said, Carl, you can write beautiful women, write this letter for me. And I did it. Okay, fine. But, uh, I decided to join the newspapers and I went into the Times of Ceylon because Donovan Moorridge, who was the assistant editor or the news editor, had also been my Sunday school master in when I was, young, when I was a boy. Mind you, we were always sent to Sunday school and my, we were always chased for Sunday mass and all that sort of thing. Ours were a weird family. They did all the crazy things and went to church on Sundays. You see? So, uh, Donovan Maldridge looked at me and said, hmm, I, I did, didn't know when you get out of that Sunday school of mine, you were a nuisance in the church also. Anyway, I'll take you in. And uh, he took me in there and I had to go and do some petty reports. And when anyone, anyone came to see me, Donovan would say, Carl, Ah, yes, I sent him to cover a fire. I hope he perishes in the flames. <laughs> let, me let me stop you right there.
where he didn't perish in the flames and he's still here to tell the tale. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Stay with us. How you got into mainstream writing? What are you doing, wasting your time here? I see some of your articles a hundred times, they're beautiful. Why don't you come and join me? What is Carl Muller as a friend? I have few friends. Because... Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Carl, um, we, were, we just talked about how you got into mainstream writing, if you can call it that. Yeah. Sunday school teacher in the newspapers, yeah. hope he perishes there. But you see, I had to begin as a proofreader. Sure. So I, put, I was put in the proofreading department and told to submit articles, little things that could be used in the Sunday Times. And I did so. And a man who looked at what I was writing in the Times and who was quite taken up by what I was doing was Reggie Michael, who was editor of the Daily Mirror. And there was a guy called Navaratna who was the chief sub, chief editor, the chief sub editor. Reggie Michael came down to the proofreading department and you know in those old days it was hot lead. There were no computers. He came down to the proofreading department and said, I say, Muller, what are you doing, wasting your time here? I see some of your articles a hundred times, they are beautiful. Why don't you come and join me? We need somebody to put a little life into the paper. I said, fine, I'll come. And I walked across to the Daily Mirror. Part of the Times group, so the Times could not say anything. In fact, they were quite happy about it. So, uh, I was with them for some time and Reggie Michael, of course, was uh, more, more or less uh, a very, very beautiful, very, very well-versed editor. He had a gift for alliteration, which was wonderful. He always alliterated his work, you see. And uh, we got on well until the time came until one day when I was there, we were invaded by a group of people who said they were from the New Sun newspaper. I think they invaded, how they got in, I do not know. But they got into the Times building at night. And there I was making up a page for the mirror when they bumped into me. And someone said, I say, what is your headline for tomorrow? I said, why do you want to know? Then he said, no, no, we have, you know, we have just come from, from Mardana. Percy Gunasena has opened a new paper and we are going to really swing that paper. Why don't you join us? I said, how much will you pay? You double my salary, I'll join you. Because you see, journalists at that time did not carry much weight. Financially, they didn't have money. And if we had money, we used to go down to the Bristol bar and have a drink. Right? It was high fun in the evenings after your work is over to go there and drink yourself silly and go home. So, uh, I decided to walk over and I met uh, D.B. Dhanapala, who looked at me and said, young man, you want to join us? I said, no. <laughs> you want me to join you? Okay, whatever it is. If you write anything more than two syllable words in your copy, I'm firing you. Now that was something new to me. But then he explained and that explanation carried me a long way. We put out a newspaper for the people in the street. We are not going to plaster them with the education uh, education we have. They are going to write so that they can read and understand. Simple English. Long sentences, taboo. You write the way you think, the way you like to write it, and you put it out. He gave me in charge of a shipping page, 
a travel page, a yarline page. He also made me a pro tem editor of the week, the weekend, which was the Sunday Islands Sunday weekly newspaper. And I was there until the newspaper folded up. To move away from writing itself, what is Carl Muller as a friend? I don't know. I have few friends because I have learned that to have many friends does not make you somebody who can be called a popular person. A few tried and trusted friends is all I need. We actually did speak to one of those true friends and this is what he had to say about the literary genius. Oh, he's an extremely warm friend. I mean, you can rely on him. Uh, he, he will stand by you and that, that we have discovered in our own lives. And I think it's partly because he feels that he can stand, he can rely on us. See, we've uh, been with him in things from, for that least, uh, well, it's nearly 20 years now. As a person, we didn't realize that he'd had such a variety of experience. Uh, he might have, he might tell you that he has been sacked from 18 public schools and he's also served in all the armed forces. Uh, ask him about the story of the goats and mutton. He, that's a hilarious one when he was out, up in the north with uh, the Navy. And another time, uh, well, he has also some pretty risky stories. Like he told us about the basket girls of Bangkok. I don't even know whether it's true, but it sounds marvelous. He's a multi-talented person and he's creative in a large number of fields. You see, even if, if you go to his house, you'll see that when you enter, the wall that faces you in the sitting room is totally covered with a fresco he has painted himself with a little help from his daughter. A fresco of equatorial flora and fauna. And it's amazingly inventive. And another point is it's technically perfect. He's a real craftsman and not just a, a dabbler. He's a pretty controlled person generally. But uh, if you are unfair to him, then he's not going to let it go. A very famous publishing house was uh, bilking him on the re returns from his publications. And uh, he let them have it. He sued them and he uh, even went public on it, you see. So he's not going to spare any uh, any injustice done to him. Shortly after the uh, the problems with the Tamils and the Indian Army had been was here, and he had written a report, which uh, some of the state authorities claimed was not true. And so one one day they appeared outside his door, and there he was, up in the fourth floor, and I think he spent about a month there. But he had fun even there. He told us how one day he gave them the shock of their lives because he arranged a disappearance. He had simply managed to climb up on the toilet into such a position that no one would think of looking for him there. And they were searching the entire security office and there was no call. They thought he had jumped out of the window or something. <laughs> that sort of thing he's quite capable of doing, you know. He jumped out of a window at uh, Royal College, uh, not expecting a master to pass by underneath, two floors below. So he and the master ended up on the side, on the paving, paving of the walkway there. He told us that out of his three marriages, one was to a rural beauty queen. And it lasted, <laughs> I think, something like two days. Not because, not because he got sick of the girl or the girl got sick of him, but it was on a lark. And uh, it's worth hearing the story from his lips. 
it's hilarious. So uh, he said he had to go into the depths of the country with this child. She was quite a young woman. And there he was, you know, welcomed warmly by her loving family. And he wanted, he, I don't know how he got out of there. Did you, get out? Did you get out? It was on a bet, was it? No, it's very simple. Uh, it was a bet taken by D.B. Dhanapala and some of the crowd at uh, the Sun newspaper that since I was just alone and hilling around it, I should get married. And they had a contest to choose the most beautiful tea plucker in the country. And this girl came out of Nagoda, Gaul. Mind you, Karyavasam's relatives, Karyavasam who was an MP, and they were not very, they were very poor. But this girl had come and she had, mind you, won the first prize. And then I was in the office in Colombo. The contest was held in New Orleans. And all the contestants were brought back by bus. The relatives and parents were staying in the Colombo office to pick the girls up and take them home. And there was this girl standing there with nobody who had come to take her home. And I had got the paper in town to print, put in the last page, everything was ready. The paper was to be circulated the next morning, and here was I ready to go home. And a girl standing there and yelling her guts out that she had no way of going home. It was a mistake from the start. <laughs> you see, because I asked her, where do you live? She said, Nagoda. I said, Nagoda? I thought it was near Kalutara. Mm. That's near Buddha. <laughs> but nevertheless. So anyway, I checked my purse. I said, look, I have about 20 rupees in my purse. How much do you need to go? To? I can't go alone in the bus. And I got bags to carry. I got presents here. I got, she was wearing a beauty a tiara and all sorts of things. I said, for God's sake, take all that out. You can't walk on the road. Some man will grab you and grab all your jewelry. So eventually, I had to tell the office gatekeeper that I was escorting this girl to the bus stand. When I went to the bus stand with the Pita bus stand, she said, we must take, we must take the gold bus. I said, but we must take, you must take. I can't go alone. Now what do I do? I said, why gold bus? We can take a Kharutara bus. No, 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 we must take a gold bus. So I got in with her. Now 20, how far will 20 rupees take me? Two tickets. Fortunately, this was somewhere in the 1975 or something like that. Bus fares were pretty cheap. So I bought two tickets to Gaul. I, I gave her the money to buy two tickets. She bought the two tickets and she said, Gaul la dekak. I couldn't understand. We went to Gaul, got her down, and we said, we must take another bus to Nagoda through Wanduramba. I never knew all these places. I was lost. We stood outside the Sydney Hotel. She got in another bus, got in with her. She told them where to get down. And when she got down, there was a hell of a hullabaloo with all villagers all standing at the bus stand. Apparently, her brother had gone to pick her up. And we don't know what happened to him. Maybe we crossed like ships in the night. And here was I stuck in this village hut with this girl and the parents, and I had to telephone from the post office, Vanduramba post office, the son, and say, I'm stuck here. What am I going to do? And do you know what the donkeys did? They all got thrown, and they said, it's a time to get slap Carl. And Dhanapada said, Carl, I have collected 50,000 rupees in bets. <laughs> if you can prove to us that you're going to marry that girl. She's the most beautiful tea plucker in the country. No. I'm sending David Karnaratna and Michael Jackson, not Michael Jackson, he's Jackson Seniviratna, in a car driven by Mr. Overland from Krispa Mudalali, who is going to be your witness. And we are all coming to Gaul, and you must register your wedding. And? So we all went and registered my wedding. Legend has it that you made sure that there was a 
mistake that was too glaring not to notice? Yes. I entered all the bride's details in the bridegroom's column and all my details in the bride's column and I wrote in English. And the man there couldn't understand a word I wrote. And first of all, we gave him a drink. We gave him a gift of a bottle of Arak, which he drank. And somebody else said, Yatavitra denne, apitat denda, matat denda, and then I had bought three bottles of Arak. I knew this was going to come up. I distributed Arak right around the place. Everybody drank, the, the, the whoever it is, the registrar, he didn't know what he was doing. He upset a cup of, cup of plain tea on top of the register. That soiled the pages a little more. The ink flowed all over. I said, thank you very much. I bought one. I went. And the next morning, I said, no. So I'm, you actually did marry her in front of everybody else? In front of everybody else, I'm supposed to have married her. Right. Right. Next morning. Did you consume at the marriage? That depends. I don't know what I did because I was <laughs> after Eric too. But the next morning, they were all going back to Sun. I said, here. Now I have to go back. I have to work. Then what about, what about your wife? Now the mother is anxious. The father is I yeah. go, you know, like what, 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 I think something was said in some of the books. I go to prepare a place for her. <laughs> <laughs> I got into the car and then I called her and said, now this is the story. I won't come back. Furthermore, you won't fit into my life. Neither will I fit into your life. And as far as I know, after you have won this, there will be plenty of people here who want to marry you. So, you have got prizes, you have got cash prizes, all that. Now here, I'm adding to that. And I collected the 50,000 bet. I gave it to her, got into the car, and I came back to Colombo. So that's how Carl Muller got away from getting married. Um, we'll be right back after a quick commercial break. Stay with us. Do you feel that you're a better parent than your father was? Has Carl Muller changed over the years? If you could trade it all back and have a happy childhood, would you take it? Welcome back. We are with Carl Muller. Carl, um, after such a childhood, um, do you feel that you're a better parent than your father was? I think so. Very much so. Do you believe that you're a better husband than your father was? Well, my father was very much taken up with my mother. He refused to listen to anything that was said or done against her. He just could not bear the thought that he had made a mistake in marrying her. He had to live and keep pretenses up. But uh, as far as I am concerned, when I decided that, look, I am making a mess of my life and I got to sit down and I got to have some sort of uniformity in what I do and some sort of, I got to develop something out of myself. It's then that I met my, my present wife, Sautain, her name is. You've been married for 30 years. And we are now married 37 years. years. We are stuck together, come or go. And Does we are very much, clo very close to each other. We have shared a lot of joys, a lot of sorrows. I have taken her abroad with me. I have taken her to Dubai, to Sharjah. I have been, wherever I went, I used to fight with my employers if my family couldn't join me. Because for me, the family is everything. In, in that sense, has Karl Muller changed over the years? Not really changed, but I think... Tempered down? Yeah, maybe I have tamped myself down a little. Because I don't want people to say, now look, uh, Karl Muller, he's as mad as ever. Uh, it's, you know, I've got now, I've got grown up children. Uh, my son is married, my daughter is, uh, my two daughters are married, I've got grandchildren now. Look, I, got, I can't play the role of a crazy old grandfather, right? And if somebody says, 
you are this or you are that. Uh, some people will say you are mad as a hatter. Some people will say you are, we cannot understand what the devil you do with your life. Other people will say, oh, he's just a dirty old man. And I just tell them, look, the trouble is an old man. That's why the dirt shows. When, you, when I was young, no dirt showed. One final question. Having lived 70 plus years, having seen what you have seen, having done what you have done, if you are hugely famous, um, your books sell very well. At the end of it all, if you could trade it all back and have a happy childhood, would you take it? No. It's all, it is that experience. It is what has, what has put, what, what sort of a ring I went through when I was young that has put me into this position today. My books are mostly autobiographical. They, I, I tear apart my own family to just show them, and I, and I mock them, to show them that what, they, what I have become is as though I am sitting in justice over them. I have brothers and sisters who haven't written to me for years. They don't even send me a card for Christmas. They don't know when my birthday is. They've just abandoned me because of the influence my mother had on the family. Now my father is dead, my mother is dead. My mother was blind when she died. You see, I have no, I have no feeling of compassion for either of them. Absolutely not. Well, with that, I'm afraid we have to close the show. Thank you very much for being with us. It was a great pleasure having you. And uh, we sincerely wish that many more books come from your family. Thank you very much.